Oh yes, I love that intro. I don't know if you like it or not, but uh, it just suits me to the ground. Uh, and I just love the fact that I've got a, a, a unique mix from uh, the mix master himself, uh, Jack Out of World and the Quantum Singularity. If you're listening, Dave, you're the man. You really are. Make some more tunes, please. I know your life gets busy. Uh, I think it's probably a bit early in the evening. I don't think many people are in the chat. Uh, if you're actually bothering to listen at this hour of the day, do you want to just put a little nod in the chat so I can see if anybody's actually tuned in? Uh, or if they're just kind of hovering in the in the wings, waiting for nine o'clock, and Sean, because there's nothing on the uh, schedule for me tonight. Uh, I don't know if this is going to be my permanent slot. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, I'm going to stick a few tunes on while you lot wake the chat up and uh, see if uh, anything's going on. Yeah, wrap your brains around this. John von Neumann in 1933. Von Neumann is the unappreciated genius of modern science. Scientists appreciate him, but the general public, I don't think, has ever heard of him. He wrote one of the best books on quantum mechanics. He was one of the pioneers of programmable computers. We wouldn't have internet without him. Anyway, maybe logic, uh, one of his major inventions, uh, instead of dividing everything into true and false like Aristotle, which only applies in the abstract. The Aristotelian logic only applies if you ignore the sensory, sensual space-time continuum in which we live. If you, if you take into context, we live in a real universe in which we're touching things, bumping into things, kissing things, loving things, hating things, throwing rocks at things, and so on. You realize that most of our perceptions are in the maybe mode. They're not yes or no. They're not true or false. They're just maybes. I think maybe logic uh, is probably the greatest invention of the 20th century. Although, of course, von Neumann had a lot of competition. Kozhupski offered an infinite valued logic in which between yes and no, we've got an infinite series of maybes. Anatole Rappaport invented a four-valued logic, true, false, indeterminate, and meaningless. Indeterminate is something which, in principle, we might be able to test someday, but right now we can't. We don't have the technology to test it. Like how much life is there in the universe? We just don't know. That's indeterminate. Meaningless are propositions that can never be tested because they're defined so they can't be tested, such as round squares eat red cabbage. First, you've got to find a round square to, before you can even begin to observe its eating habits. And since you can't find a round square, there's no way of ever testing that. Another one is the Catholic doctrine that after a priest pronounces the right formula over a piece of bread, it becomes the body of a Jew who died 2,000 years ago. And since cannibalism is good for you, you should eat the body of the dead Jew and it'll make you feel good. I don't know, Catholics are not particularly fond of Jews. I don't know why they like that one so much, but they, they like eating him anyway. Everybody else thinks they're just eating bread. They think they're eating a human being. They think they're Hannibal Lecter. We think they're nuts. I don't know. But that's an example of a, of a meaningless statement. It can't be proven or disproven. If they want to think they're cannibals, let them think it. We can't disprove it. We're not going to bother arguing about it. It's meaningless, like the round square. David Byrne and Philip Glass there with uh, from uh, music from the knee plays uh, Civil Wars, A Tree is Best Measured When It's Down, I think is the full album title um, and we had social studies there um, before that you had a bit more uh, Jack Out World and the Quantum Singularity just to freak you out a bit more message through the ether and before that was even more mind bending stuff with Robert Anton Wilson's Maybe Logic uh, expecting this show to be getting a lot more Anton Wilson as you kind of go through <laughs> I'll try not to bring any of his really contentious stuff but uh, yeah no he's a smart enough man to be able to bring a lot of his stuff to the air uh, I'm a bit quiet on that mic let me just take that up a bit uh, let me know in the chat if this is drowning out a bit but uh, I haven't got my mic stand tonight so the mic's a bit far away um yeah, it's all I really wanted to do tonight. Really, was kind of meander through, uh, kind of um, 
a rambling show with a few tracks thrown in here and there and a bit of spoken word and nothing particularly planned. Um, first of all, I'm not on the schedule for tonight, so it's not like anybody that started to pick up on the fact that I'm broadcasting again would be able to find me. <laughs> so this is really only kind of for podcast. Um so I'll try and make some sort of semblance of sense out of it all, but uh, don't expect too much sense from me tonight. I feel very, pretty insensible at the minute, if I'm quite frank. Uh, the world's been treating me really not really kindly. Um, noisy bloody dog, as usual, making us a presence felt. Hello, dear, sit down. Um, yeah, it's been a really hectic time since, well, really, since doing that show with Vin on, whenever that was, December the 15th, I think. Um, my kind of uh, head and life went into a, into a uh, tornado-like spin at that point and hasn't really calmed down since. But uh, having restored my health recently and having fixed my uh, uh, ailing back... <coughs> Uh, yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm feeling absolutely cracking at the minute, and life's good. Things are moving a great foot with um, sort of uh, various plans to try and uh, do some novel hydro power designs that I've got in the pipeline. Can't really tell you a great deal about that, but uh, trust me, that's really uh, key. The electrobiology stuff, that's just insane, that's just got mental, I've got... Um, uh, we've got a new ki- uh, new uh, listener uh, called Kieran, who is out in uh, South America, uh, Costa Rica, and his next door neighbour, <laughs> next door neighbour, lovely, lives in the mountains, what a kid. Um, uh, yeah, his next door neighbour is a, a permaculture farmer who's uh, engaged in a local permaculture group and who's very interested in... Uh, um, looking into some of my sort of work in explaining permaculture through electrobiology, and that's really where I came from with that whole thing. I don't know if if, if that kind of might have missed a few people by why I'm so frenetic about this electrobiology. Is that essentially permaculture has not been taken up as broadly as it should have been, and probably is extremely unlikely to be taken up very broadly in this country. Mm-hmm. Simply because the agrochemical multinationals bought out all the farms in the in the sort of seventies, eighties, and nineties, and so essentially all of our all of our food production in this country is now done by multinational conglomerates. Even if it looks like it's the farmer still going out and mowing the fields, he don't own them anymore. He's just another employee, another cog in the mill. Got no say in that over what he, how he runs his farm at all. <coughs> so. Um, yeah, that's what I really wanted to do is kind of bring in a little bit of a potted history of me because this is the other thing as well with the electrobiology. I keep hearing this bloody word genius and stop it at once and go away. I'm not a bloody genius. I'm not even close to being a genius. I probably couldn't even pass no level maths. So that's kind of put that to bed. Something strange happened to me. Uh, circumstance, maybe? Synchronicity? I don't know. Uh, I'm watching my boy grow up. Uh, I remember reading a book in my teens called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Mad um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Can't remember the author now, um, but essentially it was a book. Although it was about many other things, including sort of philosophy and Eastern mysticism, it was broadly uh, a book about a son on a road trip with his son. And the chap who is on the road trip with his son on a motorbike and a mate on a motorbike uh, is essentially watching his son uh, both pass through from childhood into manhood but also begin to acquire some of the um, oddness that had singled him out as a child and had led to him having to undergo... Um, I think the author actually it's a semi-autobiographical work and from memory I think the the author underwent 24 doses of ECT um, (laughs) to cure him of his sanity (laughs) Um, and essentially the book is a is a sort of a meandering travel through his rediscovered life as he stumbles upon old places that he knows from his pre-ECT days but can't remember and so it's he's he's moving through this landscape as something that he describes as a phaedrus, as a as a ghost, 
um, and at the, and simultaneously uh, watching. I mean, the, the sort of disintegration of his his son's sanity, not to any real degree, but simply to his acceptability to the rest of the world, and that's really largely where that story goes. And uh, when my twins were born, uh, one. Yeah, yeah, I'm on air, dude. <laughs> I'll edit that bit out, shall I? <laughs> so I think you're really quiet in the background. Nobody really would have caught that. <laughs> I should have warned it first. Oh, excuse, excuse me. <laughs> I've got you out a second. <laughs> the look on his face when I just told him that that was a absolute classic alright oh, um, he's just completely put me off my stroke there we have a hunt through the music library so it lined up just so I could duck out of the briefest of uh, okay. <laughs> um, where's that uh, 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 um, I don't know what I'm looking for now I'm going to just put that on uh, no not that not that not that. Oh, for God's sakes. Oh, that was it. I've not seen it there so um, So I'm not going to put it on now. I'm just lining it up. One click away. Um, oh, for God's sakes. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's in the art of self maintenance. Um, yeah, and, and when the twins were born, one of them was very different, as anybody that's heard any of my shows will probably know. Um, and his his intense difference from all of our other children turned out to be uh, uh, what, according to the DSM, his um, uh, acute spectrum ADHD. And I essentially basically found myself living the life of the Zen and the motorcycle maintenance character where I watched my incredibly extra-abled child slowly drift further and further away from anything that would be considered, you know, what I mean, normal, you know what I mean, normal human behaviour, and um, while that is a, a hard road to have to travel, and keeping a child in mainstream education, just simply for its socialisation, if nothing else, you know, what I mean, I did everything possible to de-educate them every time they came home and argue the toss with the bloody schools if they ever tried to program them more than I was prepared to accept, and. Um, yeah, essentially I found myself watching my childhood unfolding in front of my eyes and it was a really peculiar kind of experience to see you know, I mean, this, this, the difficulties that this boy of mine went through to, to make it through society unscathed. And uh, and again, it's a bizarre thing of him. I mean, it, it is, he's got a charmed life. You know, it's like the boy's the most dangerous thing on two legs to everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> It's just it's got fascination with everything sharp and shiny and electrical and hot and anything that can hurt or injure or maim or is an absolute fascination for me. I mean, to our credit, um, with that degree of uh, severity of uh, sort of social impairment, let's call it, um, due to intellectual ability, is really what I would put it down to. He's got an excessive intellectual capacity there of some description. Um, won't fit into any box comfortably. Um, I completely forgot what I was about to say then. Uh, oh, Jesus. See, this is what I love about this uh, this show. This, this is this is why I had to take another slot. I mean, let's just cover this a little bit. Yeah, this, is, this, this is why I had to take another slot. The whole omniversity thing is so straight-laced to me. I feel like I've got a collar and bloody tie on and a, and a nice neat suit while I'm doing it. I'm sure it doesn't come across that way, but that's how it feels to me. I, I want to keep the subjects on that particular um, channel very, very um, on point and strictly factual and not do too much waffling on about myself or just forgetting what I'm doing completely and not giving a damn because yeah, yeah two facts not given largely speaking um, so yeah that's why I'm on this slot now is just simply to blow off a bit of steam really and uh, hopefully bring a few people along with me because uh, I have a sort of infectious 
uh, an infectious uh, uh, philosophy that, uh, again, I wouldn't really necessarily explore with the Omniversity because it's my own personal philosophy. It's not necessarily something that would be a subject for uh, universal uh, accessibility, which is how, I mean, the fundamental basis of the Omniversity. It's supposed to be both universally accessible and universally sort of educational and inspirational. And it appears to be hitting that sort of a, a, a peg from the reports that I've been getting back from the listeners, which is great. Not one on the subject, just a, a quick shout out to the listeners. I've got, I've got to mention a few names here. We had Freshy in the chat. I don't suppose he's come back as he never bloody does. I'm going to pop into the chat when I'm not on air and say, oh yeah, I'll be back when you're on air, and then just completely forgets. But then he is mad as a box of frogs, so uh, I love Freshy. I ain't seen him for about three years. It's a real shame. We used to pop up and down the M1 all the time to each other, but he's up in bloody Derbyshire. It's like miles away. And he's insane. So, <laughs> that was really good. He was posting some um, uh, shots of him in the chat. Oh, you can scroll back up and have a look. A um, uh, couple of little uh, shorts of him. <laughs> he even, what's it, 190 kilo bloody lorry tyre. I mean, he was he was knackered a couple of years ago. You know, he pulled up to the eyeballs from the shrinks and, and like, fat as, fat as anything and really unfit. And, uh, yeah, no, uh, he was... Um, what was he? Something like bloody kickboxing champion of England or something in his in his youth. Something along those lines. I'm probably doing him a, doing him a disservice, but one of the one of the martial arts, who was actually the the country's leading proponent of it at one point. Scary man to get on the wrong side of. I bet. Um, anyway, lovely man. Um, and who else? Oh yeah, Nanny Weirdo. Oh Nanny Weirdo. I've never mentioned your name, Nanny W. Come on, I mean, just you're the star of the show. You really are. There's very few people that send me to Google, and Nanny Weirdo definitely is one of those. Love and peace, Nanny. Nanny Weirdo. No, love and peace, or should I say, Fiat Lux? <laughs> um, yeah, Nanny Weirdo is one of my many um, whispers from the grapevine. Uh, I don't know exactly quite how deep inside she is, and I don't really want to explore that too much on air because I know that she's exposed herself to some not insubstantial risk in the past, and I definitely don't want her in a in a um, putting herself in those dangers at this late stage in her life. I just it's just not not certainly not for my benefit. So uh, yeah, our communications are largely undertaken through a scramble of uh, innuendo, slang, gibberish. Um, uh, half told something left for a while and then picked up a little bit later and sort of music references being used as shorthand so you know, I mean like a, a drop about an old Frank Zappa tune might uh, indicate that we're talking about bioweapons or something you know what I mean if, if we both understand the reference and we're both from that era so yeah we kind of get that shit and it's just, it's just, it's just, she's just a stalwart, stalwart campaigner against all sorts of stuff, and still going at, at some grand old age. I never actually dare to, you know. So I know she's, I know she's getting on a bit. Um, who else have we got? Oh, picked up Joan recently. Oh, Joan in the chat is a lovely lady. I uh, you lot should look after her and treasure her. Um, She's an absolute star. I've been. I, I just spend all my time when I'm off air just chatting to Joan these days off air. I don't say she's in the chat now. I know she went out to work about four o'clock. And I don't she, she think she gets back in a little bit later. So I'll probably miss her these sort of times. But yeah, she's a regular for the uh, Omniversity and has been listening to virtually every word and following along and sending me other links during the week. And she's another one that sends me a bloody Google. And that really is a rare event. I mean, I'm one of those that's kind of got an attic mind. So, the, you know, I mean, if I'm going to Google, it's usually a search something scholastic that I already half know about and just need to go and check up on. But those two lasses both have <laughs> me scurrying to go. And we're dropping all these references. I'm like, huh? Who? Huh? And yeah, rather than show my own stupidity, Google is your friend. Keep repeating it after me. Google is my friend. It means me no harm. Google is my friend. It means me no harm. Google is neutral. I mean, it's not. It's not good, bad, or indifferent. It's just neutral. It is exactly what you do with it. So you know, I mean, it's down to you if you want to put all your personal shit through there, or uh, if you want to keep everything tied up tight. And just a, a, a moot point on that particular little subject is, I've now been online for twenty years this year. This will be my twentieth year. 
on the internet. Well, if I was to tell you my real name now, on air, it would make no difference at all. You couldn't find a damn thing about me. Um, the only stuff in my real name is on the dark net in terms of like the sort of online banking and stuff that I do that isn't accessible to the Google search engines. So, I mean, I have remained online now for 20 years and remained entirely incognito as far as my real name or any of my real details. Um, I know of no no face on picture that's ever been sort of tagged with my name in it. Um, even if you Google my name, I think the, the the Freeman Jack thing, you might, if you're lucky, find a single image. There's a there's an old video that I've done here of me looking in a hideous mess. Oh, my God, I was a state back then. Jeez, rough enough now, but, boy, I was a mess then. I was insane, too. Um, so that's hardly going to give anybody the impression that I'm anything to uh, be concerned about, that's for sure. <laughs> Oh, how little they know. Oh, and Paul, of course, Paul, who's listening now. Paul's been uh, a regular here for the last couple of uh, last couple of months and uh, is a real solid lad. Uh, been coming over from uh, where he lives over, uh, sort of north, northwest London, sort of outside the M25. It's a fair old stroll to get to here. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's another... This, this, this is the other glory of people's internet radio, and this is possibly the thing that a lot of people don't realise, is that most of the hosts that are on here will have come through the chat box and as listeners and thought, I can do that. Kiss a job. Which wasn't quite my route to the microphone, but it was pretty bloody close. I mean, I ended up on here because of John bloody Harris. Um was a uh, part of sort of, I wasn't actually a TPUC admin, I always refused, but I was always being offered a job for a moderator or admin over there from uh, Ben or um, uh, um, Dan, sorry, Dan Hughes. Um, yeah, and always refused because I didn't want to have to curb what I said on that particular little forum because I always bloody made sure that I spoke the truth. Um, and it was in a, a group call with them over Skype. And uh, I happened to mention to John that oh, the TPUC should take after, um, take a leaf out of a uh, UK Columns book and start doing like a radio show of like a media presence. He's turned around to me and gone, Gordon, then. Me? Really? I was kind of thinking you, actually, but uh, all right, okay. And that was how kind of TPU CFM was born, and that really kind of landed me here. Never quite managed to shake it off. So, uh... anyway, I'm going to stick this tune on, have a look in the chat, because I never look at the chat. I mean, if any of you ever put anything in the chat, you better either PM me it, or if the, you know I mean, if the chat's busy, PM me it, because uh, I've never managed to keep up with the chat if it's busy, and I never look at it when I'm talking, because I can't talk and read at the same time. It's like rubbing my head and rubbing my belly and patting my head simultaneously it's like one, some of those people some people wouldn't do it I can't <laughs> anyway a bit more Dave Byrne a bit old Dave Byrne no, talking heads let's change your mind Brian is English without the use of any form of is or being we're trapped in linguistic const- constructs all that is is metaphor I believe somebody said that before me. I've decided we can't get beyond words. What we got to do is get more cynical about our words. You'll find that by dispensing with is and trying to reformulate without is, you just naturally fall into the kind of expression which is considered acceptable in modern science. Uh, Also, it's the type of consciousness that uh, Zen Buddhism tries to induce. Using E prime, you will understand modern science and Zen Buddhism both a lot better than you've ever understood them before. Martin Gardner has written a long essay proving that to think like this will destroy your mind. I, I, think, it, I think it adds tremendously to clarity. I am removing the is from my writing more and more. Removing it from your speech is even harder. Instead of thinking the grass is green, to think the grass appears green to me. And this saved me a lot of time, uh, by the way. 
I don't get embroiled in arguments like Beethoven is better than Mozart or rock is better than soul. I define such things as meaningless. And so people get into arguments like that. I just say, well, Beethoven seems better to me than Mozart most of the time. But I don't say Beethoven is better than Mozart. I return to E prime in my thinking whenever I find myself getting angry at somebody or, or feeling depressed or hopeless or having negative emotional states in general. Once you put them in, and once you take out all the is's out of all your negative statements, you find out they're all relative to how you feel at the moment. People would by and large act a hell of a lot more sanely, especially if they, you know, when they got rid of is, they dropped, they put maybe in more sentences. I think if everybody used maybe more often, the, the increase in general sanity would be absolutely, it would, it would seem absolutely astonishing. And, completely flabbergasted everybody. What the hell is we suddenly got a planet full of sane people? When did that start to happen? I didn't even notice it. You just listen to the craziest people on the news and on television or the craziest columnists in the newspapers. You notice they never say maybe. They're always quite sure. And they always know is. And they never say seems. They always say is. I am continually astonished at all the people in the world who think they have the answer to everything. None of them ever suspect they might be cosmic schmucks and have the wrong answer. And I find that the only explanation that makes sense to me is in Korzybski's science and sanity. These people don't know how to use language properly. They're using language in an overly dogmatic way which sets their brain into overly dogmatic modes. So they think dogmatically, they perceive dogmatically, they even smell dogmatically, they hear dogmatically. They're, they're locked in a trap of fixed, fixed neurosemantic circuits in their brains. Whereas knowing I'm a cosmic schmuck, I always think of at least five alternatives. When people start arguing about words, they're mostly arguing about whether the words that they apply to the objects they have created out of the infinity of uh, possible objects that could be put together. They picked up a few of them, and they put words on them, and they quarrel about the words. And if, uh, if these people get to the stage where they're willing to kill one another over the words, they should be put in a nice, quiet home in the country with kindly doctors and beautiful nurses and good sedatives. But generally, they end up in government mansions and start bombing one another. Or they lead religious crusades for the true faith and kill one another with swords or some such thing. Typical. Somebody just bluffed knocking in at the door just as that was finishing. One second. Back in a second. I think that was Pumpson's door. Yeah, that was the right This is the Freeman Jack Show, not Omniversity. I don't give a damn. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for it. <laughs> Thing finished. You turned up simultaneously. Front door's there. Yeah, you're going to get a lot of this at this time of the evening. I'm literally like nine feet from the front door and through a thin wall, so <laughs> it's a suck out if you don't like it. Um, oh, I suppose I ought to even do that, really, hadn't I? It's just this early in the evening. No, this is the Freeman Jack show, and uh, you'll be subjected to adult topics with periodic... You know, you know I mean, we know there's a band going on and all that, you know what I mean? We're supposed to mind our P's and Q's, certainly before the witched hour. <laughs> so I'll be broadly trying to mind my language, but I am a foul mouth git, so it, it may slip out occasionally. So if you've got any particularly delicate ears in front of the radio, you may be better. Possibly I don't know, sticking them down in front of a cartoon or plugging ear, Granny's ears with a pair of socks or something. Um. Putting your head in a bucket of water helps, I find, when listening to my show. Um, right, where were we? Oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remembered why I was off air. <laughs> That's what it tends to. Where I was going with that whole ADHD, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance thing and all the rest of it. Keep up at the back. Come on. Pay attention. <laughs> The important ramblings of a very old goat. Yeah. <laughs> it has deeper meaning. You may not see it just yet, but it does. And that last uh, Robert Anton Wilson as well, just to point out the. Uh, um, I'm always being criticised for using uh, things like I think and possibly and perhaps and maybe. 
in a lot of my stuff and it's often been a criticism of people and I just have to point out that if I'm not damn sure about something I ain't saying it is because I ain't sure I might be prepared to consider it I might be con- con- you know, prepared to sort of mull it over in my mind and hold it as a as a probability as a possibility maybe even an extreme possibility you know maybe even a 99% probability you know, 99.99% probability you know, but I mean, no, not even probably 99.9% Probable, uh, uh, probable, probably sure that I exist. So I don't know whether anything quite gets that high on my particular score, but that's my belief system. Welcome to it. <laughs> anything that you can't handle from here on in is your own problem. <laughs> this is the red. This is Red Pill Radio. <laughs> Oh, I'm talking to Red Pill Radio as it goes. Yeah, get ready, hold on to your hats from university this week. We're going uh, plastic reality with digital, virtual, holographic reality theory. Um, be bringing you all sorts of skinned. Uh, oh, I don't know, I've got hours and hours of audio to sort through. I'm not even going to bother to try and rattle for it now. We'll bring, bring some Tom Campbell, maybe a bit of uh, Bruce Lipton in here and there, a bit of Sheldrake, but um, pretty broadly me, because. Uh, it's just another one of those subjects. It's, 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 it's so well, kind of a world expert expert on it, I guess. Because while I love Tom Campbell, I love him dearly. I suspect that I've taken his work further. Um, yeah, we, he broadly agreed with some of my sort of mild criticisms of some of his use of certain terms. Yeah, funny enough, you know, Anton Wilson saying that specificity of words is really where it's all at. Uh, if we can't say something and know from the other end of the, the the conversation what is meant by that word, then we might as well just talk in gibberish. So semant- semantics and linguistics are, are all key, really key. Um, yeah, so where I was going with the Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Mountain stuff... Uh, essentially, I, I realize, now realise that I must have been an ADHD child. You know what I mean, this is years before it was ever really recognised. I was just a difficult child. You know what I mean? I was that one that none of the teachers ever wanted in their class, none of the sports masters ever wanted in their PE groups. None of the bloody no, oh, no. Actually, it was a bit different with the with the with the physical stuff. My metalwork class teachers always loved me. I mean, I took. Oh, basically, uh, where did we start? I think it was 13. We moved up to the upper school in th- at 13 and started doing, like, sort of big school woodwork and big school metalwork classes. And my school was, like, one of these sort of multi-thousand kid sync comprehensives in Essex. And it was one that had a non-exclusion policy, so it didn't matter what any of the kids did. They were never excluded from school. They might be held in internal exclusion, but they would never be excluded from school, and they would accept any kid that was excluded from any other school in the area. So consequently, I mean, I shared my classrooms with what went on to be, I think, three murderers that I know of, and several kind of uh, manslaughter and what have you cases came out of my peer, peer group. Um, so it's more a matter of surviving, survival rather than education but uh, essentially the metalwork class within a few weeks of starting had proved themselves to be so goddamn dangerous uh, so completely untrustworthy uh, completely incapable of any sort of uh, workshop discipline that uh, essentially the, 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 the metalwork class teacher just gave up completely with the class and essentially delineated the class down two lines, those that were prepared to actually observe sort of machine shop safety and do some work, and those that wanted to stand over by the door and smoke fags. And the ones that wanted to go over the door and smoke fags went over the door and smoke fags, and the ones that wanted to do metal work had to come and see me. And essentially I took my metal work class from the age of 13 until O-level. Um, consequently I didn't actually have anything to show when it came to the uh, it was a bizarre situation where the examiner came around to all of these 
identical benches of uh, the metal toolbox, the the cast aluminium G clamp, the this and the that that are all on the curriculum. And then there was my bench with the handmade angle poise lamp and the weird clamp that I'd made to fix a bloody rubber joint to a Hillman imp and a few other bits and pieces. And fortunately, the teacher had to explain that I was some kind of, sort of star pupil and that the reason why. I mean, none of my work was sort of curriculum work was simply because I'd spent my entire school life basically getting the rest of the class through the curriculum uh, so yeah I, I don't know where, where does that come from I mean, where, the, where, does, where does a 13 year old be invested with taking a machine shop class uh, I mean I know that I'd started working I'd started work I think I must have been 11 or 12 I started uh, brazing the tungsten carbide tips to high-speed circular saws um, and then kind of migrated from that onto the sharpening of those at about sort of 12, I guess, something like that. I was working on that for like pocket money all the weekends and sort of school holidays and that. My mate's dad up the top of the road had a little company. And so I was, you know, I mean, machine shop safety was literally a matter of life and death to me. It was working in little dodgy old fucking, oh, excuse my friend, um, dodgy old uh, sort of sheds out the back of uh, Gantz Hill. And, uh, yeah, the places were lethal. So, yeah, everybody knew that they had to mind each other's back. I mean, I had my finger saved by somebody looking over my shoulder once where I was stupid enough to put my hand down into a moving machine and fortunately yanked me back in time that I only received a fairly minor injury. But <laughs> still carry the uh, detritus under the skin of my finger and from that to this day, you know, 40 years later. What are you looking at me for, cat? There's no lap here. Go talk to the dog. Garden cat has finally moved indoors. We've had a real mouse mouse problem in here all winter because it's been so warm that bloody GC garden cat stayed in the garden. Unusually, he normally comes in around November, and then he's a mice problem that we have sort of as uh, an equilibrium. <laughs> a mouse cat equilibrium is arrived at in the house. This place is an old Victorian place. It's running alive with the gits. And where it's been a warm winter, we've been like scurrying with the things. And geez, he's been sitting outside on the fence, <laughs> doing nothing about them. But he's finally moved back in. Now the weather's finally cooled down a bit. And uh, yeah, he's doing his usual mousing machine. Uh, you wouldn't believe it from the little ball of fur. He looks too cute to be uh, as lethal as he is. But yeah, he kind of switches modes. He turns from like cute kitten type ball of fluff to this kind of mean killing machine as soon as he has the scurry of a mouse it's quite incredible to watch the transition he always looks so dim as well normally and as soon as he hears a mouse it's like he actually in some part of his brain engages yeah, well, I was, oh yeah is there anything on a motorcycle <laughs> so as I said there's going to be a bit of a rambling show there's always going to be a bit of a rambling show this is a particularly rambling show because I didn't even bother to do any preparation at all. in fact I got to the middle of the afternoon and I suddenly thought oh, damn it it's Wednesday isn't it I'm supposed to be on air tonight oh um, anyway such is life it's been a busy day uh, if Ojo's listening yeah Bruce good mate trust me this is a uh, uh, top op, top form um yeah, and then the art motorcycle main. Yeah, so I'm watching, watching. You know I mean, my son evolve through this. You know I mean, supposed you know I mean, social disorder. I'm realising that that was me and how you know I mean, how much of a problem bloody child it was for most of my teachers. I just ask questions. I was fascinated by everything. That was all, always seemed to trouble them. I don't know why my questions would be so troubling unless I somehow incapable of bloody answering it and certainly one of the few teachers that would ever answer me was my physics teacher usually was shut up <laughs> or or sometimes he would qualify that statement with shut up that's a level uh, which was somehow supposed to inform me that the o level curriculum taught it completely 180 degrees to where it actually was and that i wouldn't be finding out how it actually worked until i started a level which of course due to my financial standing as coming from a working class family was never actually going to happen we could never afford to for me to go from secondary school into even further education sixth form let alone college or anything so yeah i kind of finished school at 15 and i was like one of the the younger ones in any given year because of how late in the year my birthday is 
And so I finished school at 15 and started work pretty much straight away. I went into uh, heavy engineering, went to steel stockholders, stainless steel stockholders in Stratford, and started working with sort of five ton lump plates of steel and driving forklift trucks and working with big hairy ass five kilowatt plasma cutters. I mean, plasma cutters, they're there straight away. You know, the first job that I have, I'm dealing with one of the most exotic devices that you will ever find in any, any workshop. I mean, let's just cover this bloody plasma cut I used to work with. The, the Mesa, the, the big fella, the 5 kilowatt, 5 kVA, would put out a beam of solid electrons that was like a bloody laser, but as thick as your little finger, like a quarter of an inch thick. And this thing would slice straight through six inches of plate stainless steel of, like, chemical grade consistency, and it would cut at about a half an inch a second. So this thing used to just slice straight through, and it would be parallel cut, absolutely perfectly straight. It wouldn't even be like any sort of uh, uh, fringing at the bottom. And to be able to achieve this, it was just like monstrous voltages and um, like a, sh- a water shroud that would then have like inert gases like nitrogen and argon and stuff like that sprayed into it. And then the, the electricity would be applied, and it would just like follow this uh, high-pressure jet of water down the middle. It was like, literally like sort of halfway water car, halfway plasma car. So yeah, I was like working around those from pretty much you know, as soon as I got out of short trousers. And I migrated from there on to the, the uh, mechanics job. And again, walked into there, no bloody qualifications, just a good gob on me and a pair of hands and uh, proved myself useful. Ended up eight years there. Um, while I was there I got done for drink driving which would have been the end of any sort of mechanics career in that sort of day and age in the in the sort of back street mechanics trade but fortunately I'd kind of enamoured myself to the governor enough and he had this little kind of plan on the go about staking uh, Cortina prop shafts with this um, sort of pick of a tool that he'd acquired for sort of 25 quid or something and so rather than sacking me on the spot because I picked up this driving van, he's kind of gone, all right then, all right, we'll keep you on, but you're out on the back bench and you're, you're staking prop shafts. All right, fair dues. Well, f- three or four... Shh, I'm on air. Uh, three or four years later, the, the <laughs> prop shaft business is slowly encroaching further and further into the garage and uh, the garage has now been entirely absorbed by that business. And uh, Dynaprop Balancing is the, the dominant company of the Ron Morris Motors Group, I think, <laughs> which is quite comedic, comedic if you knew him. Don't suppose you'll ever hear, but sat me on the spot for bloody asking for a five pound raise in my wages after I've been working for him for eight years for the same money. Tight git. Ah, well, you lost, Ron. <laughs> Suck out. Yeah, so I went from there, I went to oh, heavy welding, you know, you got nothing bloody by halves, you know what I mean, I didn't just go to regular ass, you know what I mean, tin plate welding like everybody does, no, I have to go into big heavy welding, you know what I mean, welding up like 20 ton steel boxes with a quarter inch, quarter ton steel plate, working in like ridiculous air temperatures and stupidly powerful bloody tools, in fact they were all nearly 5k, weren't they, I can't remember now, big, big bugger. Uh, MIG welders and TIG welders used to blow out all the radio stations all around <laughs> and tell me use the TIG it was so powerful it would make every single radio signal just fart in the local area <laughs> used to get the neighbours telling us not to use it when it's sort of 5 o'clock went past because they don't get any TV signal yeah, big sparks make big radio farts uh, it's called a squelch in the trade so yeah, it's just a kind of journey that I'm taking. Nothing, you know, no educational real qualifications, no real uh, massive fascination with the sciences really until much, much later. So you know, I'm not, I'm not anything bloody special. I've just had an extraordinary life, and through medical conditions, you know, drug abuse, starvation in some bloody cases, it's certainly not been an easy life. I've gone hungry more times than I care to remember. Um, that I just arrive in these strange places where I find out strange things and it all seems to add up and I arrive at the place that I find myself today a very peculiar one <laughs> it's certainly a very dualistic existence anyway
bashing on another tune. Oh, look at that, it's 8 o'clock already. What happened there? I must have blinked. That was some injury. The Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace by John Perry Barlow. Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come to you from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. We have no elected government, nor are we likely to have one. So I address you with no greater authority than that which liberty itself always speaks. I declare the global social space we are building to be naturally independent of the tyrannies you seek to impose on us. You have no moral right to rule us, nor do you possess any methods of enforcement we have true reason to fear. Governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. You have neither solicited nor received ours. We did not invite you. You do not know us, nor do you know our world. Cyberspace does not lie within your borders. Do not think you can build it, though it were a public construction project. You cannot. It is an act of nature, and it grows itself through our collective actions. You have not engaged in our great and gathering conversation, nor did you create the wealth of our marketplaces. You do not know our culture, our ethics, or the unwritten codes that already provide our society more order than could be obtained by any of your impositions. You claim that there are problems among us that you need to solve. You use this claim as an excuse to invade our precincts. Many of these problems don't exist. Where there are real conflicts, where there are wrongs, we will identify them and address them by our means. We are forming our own social contract. This governance will arise according to the conditions of our world, not yours. Our world is different. Cyberspace consists of transactions, relationships and thought itself arrayed like a standing wave in the web of our communications. Ours is a world that is both everywhere and nowhere, but is not where bodies live. We are creating a world that all may enter without privilege or prejudice, accorded by race, economic power, military force or station of birth. We are creating a world where anyone, anywhere, may express his or her beliefs, no matter how singular, without fear of being coerced into silence or conformity. Your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement and context do not apply to us. They are all based on matter, and there is no matter here. Our identities have no bodies, so unlike you, we cannot obtain order by physical coercion. We believe that from ethics, enlightened self-interest, and the common wealth, our governance will emerge. Our identities may be distributed across many of your jurisdictions. The only law that all our constituent cultures would generally recognise is the golden rule of do no harm. We hope we will be able to build our particular solutions on that basis, but we cannot accept the solutions you are attempting to impose. In the United States today, you have created a law, the Telecommunications Reform Act, which repudiates your own constitution and insults the dreams of Jefferson, Washington, Mill, Madison, de Tocqueville and Brandreth. These dreams must now be born anew in us. You are terrified of your own children since they are natives in a world where you will always be immigrants. Because you fear them, you entrust your bureaucracies with the parental responsibilities you are too cowardly to confront yourselves. In our world, all of the sentiments and expressions of humanity, from the debasing to the angelic, are parts of a seamless whole, the global conversation of bits. We cannot separate the air that chokes from the air upon which wings beat. In China, Germany, France, Russia, Singapore, Italy and the United States, you are trying to ward off the virus of liberty by erecting guard posts at the frontiers of cyberspace. These may keep out the contagion for a short time, but they will not work in a world that will soon be blanketed in bit-bearing media. Your increasingly obsolete information industries would perpetrate themselves by proposing laws in America and elsewhere that claim to own speech itself throughout the world. These laws would declare ideas to be another industrial product no more noble than a pig iron. 
in our world, whatever the human mind may create, can be reproduced and distributed infinitely, at no cost. The global conveyance of thought no longer requires your factories to accomplish. These increasingly hostile and colonial measures place us in the same position as those previous lovers of freedom and self-determination who had to reject the authorities of distant, uninformed powers. We must declare our virtual selves immune to your sovereignty. Even as we continue to consent to your rule over our bodies, we will spread ourselves across the planet so that no one can arrest our thoughts. We will create a civilization of the mind in cyberspace, May it be more humane and fair than the world your governments have made before. John Perry Barlow Typical bloody freshie. Turn up in the chat after I finish bigging him up. Well, I ain't going to big you up while you're in the chat because I know what you're like and you'll bloody naff off again, won't you? Anyway, yeah, you have to listen to the uh, replay of this and uh, you'll hear a big shout out to you. Uh, freshie doesn't even realise it is the real key in uh, the whole electrobiology thing. So, uh, yeah, no, big up the freshie. Uh, I'll tell you about that when we see each other next, all right. Um, yeah, kind of, the revolution will not be televised, folks. You know what I mean? Switch off that, that goddamn thing. It's just bending your minds. You know what I mean? Let's get educated. Let's get informed. Let's stop focusing on the... the, the uh, mundane and the unimportant because there's too much important stuff coming down the line. I wouldn't cover this necessarily in Omniversity but we are in a very short uh, sore tooth before the 45 degree slope of peak oil hits. Uh, my best estimate is around six years now. Uh, I've been watching this occur having had full knowledge of the predictions of its effect on the, the global economy and the predictions that I had in 2005 have all borne out to be absolutely true. He didn't know exactly how long this sawtooth period would last, but his predictions were getting very close to the earliest predictions, and we're not very far away from the latest predictions, and I trust this uh, very wise old economist uh, far more than I would the media or the papers. So essentially we've got a very short time to prepare. The Committee of 300, the final Committee of 300 report to the UN was not made public. Fortunately we have one of the Committee of 300 went public because he was incensed that the third report was not made public and essentially the third report said we're screwed. Basically we used up too much oil, we used up too much coal and now we haven't got en enough energy left in the planet to convert the the 21st century to... Uh, renewables and sustainable so something's going to go well either we put up with that being a conclusion or we prove the damn committee of 300 wrong yeah? well that's going to mean getting organised Yeah, not sitting there and being like little keyboard reactionaries and, and busy fussing over feminism or flat earth or any of that crap because you're going to be dying in the streets if you keep that up honestly you're going to be dying in the streets you've got to do this all right, and this is where you know, I mean, a couple of the lads in the chat will back me up on this. I don't just talk the talk. Uh, I ain't going to go into details because I'd have my door kicked in by tomorrow if you knew what I was up to. <laughs> if you knew what I was up to tonight. Fuck, no. And driving through checkpoints as well. There's London's all checkpoints. Terrorist checkpoints. Errorists. Got to make sure there's no errorists amongst you. Especially if they're Asian errorists. And yeah, that basically appeared to be the coup as they were shaking down anyone that was brown or not quite pasty-faced like me and was giving them a good uh, once-over. Nice big police presence, though, in a nice twee little Greenwich. Always good to see that they're uh, hitting the hard spots first, hitting the hard targets. Um, but yeah, authenticity is really kind of... You know what I mean, that's really... Um, all of those jobs that I got when I was young... I got them by walking into them and saying, look, I've never done this before. I've done this, this, this and this. And I was pretty damn good at them and I picked them up real quick. Guess the job. And I kind of lived by my trade and I lived by my word and if I cocked up, I did it again. And if need be, I'd do it again for free. And if need be, I'd pay for the bits that I'd broke. Because that kind of, you know what I mean? That, 
no insurance policy on life, you know, any precautionary principle can only ever stretch so far, and if you're playing a trade, then you need to behave honourably. That's how I suppose for me, especially in the motor trade, I, I mean, I, man, I had my throat cut so many times. I would refuse to stoop to the same sort of strategies. And even then, even at the even at the garage, by me Jesus wept. I never used to stop work. I used to be at that garage till bloody eleven o'clock at night. I used to have all me all me poor friends turn up come six o'clock when the doors should be sliding closed, and the governor pissed off. And all me mates would be turning up that couldn't afford to actually pay anybody to fix their bloody cars. And I'd be in there till eleven o'clock every night, including Saturdays. Sometimes even go down on a Sunday and open up. I used to keep all me mates' cars on the road pretty much for free. I used to get a bit of a bollocking every now and then taking a bit too much engine oil because I would always be servicing up their cars for free and not taking any money off them for it. Well, the kind of, I mean, the principle that I run to is if, you know, if you can elevate, you know, I, mean, I don't know, maybe it's just coming from the sort of abject poverty. You know, I, mean, I grew up in a house that you, the upstairs windows used to have a permafrost during the winters. You know, I mean, this is when we had real winters through the 70s. And the winter had set in in November and it wouldn't go till bloody March. And we used to have a permafrost, like a half inch thick crust of ice on the inside of the windows in all the upstairs rooms because we only had like one little paraffin here in the middle of the living room. And we used to fight over who could sit like the closest to that as kids because that was the only spot in the house where you didn't sit and shiver. <coughs> um, so yeah, you know what I mean? It's not, I'm not a man of bloody substance, but I am a man of my word. And I am authentic. You know, and if I say something, it's because I know it, and because I've tried it and done there, been there, seen that, done that, or at least done something close enough to it that I've got a pretty bloody good idea as to how that's going to work. And I suppose you know, and that's the sort of engineering and the mechanic in me as well. And the fact that I was never put off by sort of electrics or exotic hydraulics. That was another thing as well. I became the sort of go-to guy for Citroen owners from about the age of twelve. <laughs> <laughs> um, I put my mum into a Citroen DS Palace uh, from the sort of Hilburn Imps and stuff I think uh, 12 or 13 and uh, uh, hydraulics went on it so I basically had to teach myself Citroen hydraulics and these things are really exotic bloody hydraulics they've got the, the hydroelastic suspension things have got like um, pressurised nitrogen spheres uh, that work over the top of a, a pump pumped hydraulic system and the whole circuit runs at about two and a half thousand psi and it would literally slice straight through your finger if you used to puncture a pipe while it's pressurized it would cut your finger off quite happily and it's that sort of pressure fluid and uh, yeah i basically learned how to fix my mum's one and as soon as sort of people saw me working outside on that and saw the sort of scrap one that i kept on the yard to, to sort of scavenge bits off of they sort of started knocking on my door. Oh, we should fix Citroens because none of the garages in the area would go near the damn things in the seventies. I mean, they weren't as reliable as they are today, and they often broke down. And these bloody exotic hydraulics—they didn't just run the suspension on this like pump-driven hydraulics. It was the brakes, it was the steering, everything bloody ran off the thing. So when the hydraulics failed, it was like a serious failure. And again, you know, I—I you know, I, I had some bizarre overbearing sense of responsibility and duty. I knew that I had no kind of mechanics insurance. I knew that I had no public liability insurance. So if I did work on somebody's car and sent them off in it and they had some fatal crash, I knew whose door they'd be coming knocking on. And I, I just... There's something about that mindset. There's something about that sort of precautionary mindset and of that, that sort of... The honour that that... You know I mean, I know that there's not much honour in mechanics and it's probably a bit of a push for most of you to actually believe that there could have ever been such a thing as an honourable mechanic but if there is, is ever such a thing it was me um, and so yeah just straight bloody business and and through learning how to conduct myself straight in business I learned how to conduct myself straight in life and through learning through the various sort of engineering trades and agriculture and forestry and Oh God, man! That's what I passed through. Bloody photography. Then on the the video trade. I don't know you touched on that. I think that's another eight, ten, nearly ten years in the in the commercial sort of um, 
uh, audio visual video trade initially as a cameraman but then when all the digital cameras came in cameramen became cheap as chips and I was too expensive so uh, I'd get booked more for the, the sort of conference work than the, the big venues as an audio guy or uber tech because they used to be at the uh, Albert Hall kind of uh, just running around and making sure that all the other techs weren't making a mess of it god that used to be some miles Jesus wept I did a, an Aida once and uh, the kids had got one of them pedometers in their cereal packet or something when they were doing all that stuff. You know, the things that count the, the number of steps that you take. And so I just as a laugh, I put this bloody pedometer on for this uh, this performance of Aida. And of course, the Albert Hall's this huge circular building with all the, I think, it's like nine, seven or nine floors that you can access as the public. And then there's a few that you can't access as the public as, as a tech. I would have had to have got to, including the, uh, the Oculus, the... the hole in the middle where we used to be able to go and stand over the top of the entire dome like under the dome of the the Albert Hall on a mesh grating with I think it was a 120 foot drop below us and nothing but the mesh grating underneath that would give you a vertigo I'll tell you right, looking down on the top of all those like flying saucer polystyrene things that they had to put up to fix the acoustics and we'd be sort of flying projectors and speakers and shit out of that sort of, that sort of area uh, we used to have had a little smoking clue. <laughs> you know, the, the sort of layout of the stage at the Albert Hall, there's that huge, great big pipe organ at the back of the stage. Or if you ever see that on screen again, look to the left of that pipe organ, you'll see like a black wooden screen sort of cutting off the last few rows of seats. Well, the last few rows of seats are still in there, and there's a door on the end of there for staff only. <laughs> there used to be plumes of smoke coming out from behind there the whole time. <laughs> Any performance was on in the Albert Hall when our crew were in there. <laughs> we even watched it. You know, like sometimes you know, you've got loads of smokers in your living room, and you get that haze. Settles on the room at like sort of four or five feet. We did the entire Albert Hall like that. Uh, how anybody didn't complain about that, I do not know. And throughout the performance as well, because we could see those little red glows, a little like wafts of smoke rising from all the little technicians' booths. Oh, anyway, this pedometer, yeah, anyway, so going round and round the Albert Hall and up and down these bloody nine floors, floor walking for like, I don't know, Aida was ridiculous. I think there was like seven sound booths. Seven sound booths, three or four different vision mixers, and loads and loads and loads of kind of like monitor f- throughput and uh, um, oh, just a whole com- complex fucking you know, whole complex setup. And uh, yeah, twenty-two miles. I ended up walking that night, according to this pedometer, when it kind of when you calculated out the strides. So uh, yeah, so a night's floor walking could be quite a busy enterprise, especially with something like Aida as well. Because I think that particular night we'd um, we'd done the get in from like sort of five a.m. So from five a.m. we'd been offloading like sort of five articulated lorries full of boxes of kit and installing them, like sort of wheeling them in as, as roadies and then installing them as techs and then running them as as technicians. Uh, uh, busy old life that was I used to work ridiculous hours with that and I think the same again you know when you're a man in that business you just there's, you don't get a minute of unprofessionality if you show one minute of flawed utmost professional behaviour you'll never work in that trade again and you, or we always used to joke about um, uh, there's no such thing as a sick day in the AV tech business, because uh, I mean, if you wanted to throw a sickie, you'd have to produce a death certificate signed by you know, I mean, both your great grandparents. And literally, I think ten years of teching. The only time I ever came away sick was one time when I'd eaten something dodgy during the actual day's work, and had been taken just so violently sick that I couldn't be near any of the punters because I was making them all feel queasy. <laughs> So yeah, you just kind of that taught me about getting up and doing it at whatever day it was, whatever time of the day it was, however many hours you've been doing it for. When it called for it, you just got up and did it, and that's a real big lesson in life because I really I, I learnt just how far you can push yourself. I mean, some of those jobs used to go on like thirty six hours straight, and you'd get like a couple of hours sleeping on a bunch of not used sort of stage flats around the back of the stage while there was a performance going on and all the PA running and all that. I mean, that would be your rest for your 36 hours and then you'd be driving over the five-ton lorry load back to the workshop to go and offload at God only knows what time in the morning. But that was the life. I mean, you got paid for the job and the pay was good. 
and I gave all that up actually out my discovery you know what I mean Brian Gerrish Brian Gerrish's work on Common Purpose and uh, I was working in the conference trade and had no idea as to the sort of Tavistock connections there and the PR connections and all the dodginess going on there with the sort of mind control propaganda sort of meme and I suddenly found myself at a social workers conference providing the, the, the AV support the technical support for an obvious common purpose plant who's essentially trying to propagandise and uh, alter perceptually a whole group of social workers concept of pedophilia and I could see exactly what they were doing and there was actually one guy in the audience who was the one kind of uh, open mind and he stood up and objected and he got bloody what do they call it um, Strasbourg no what is it the uh, something or other technique uh, the shaky hands mob used to use it at um, Occupy. I mean, it is the Strasbourg technique. But anyway, they had like sort of two or three plants in the audience and they rounded on him, on him simultaneously. And because there were three of them and one of him, the audience naturally do their kind of sheep job and go with the the, the three voices instead against the one. And so this guy ended up you know, walking out in shame from a lecture that he could clearly see was doing something other than what it said on the tin. And when I got called to return to that same conference's next circuit, it used to be like a, I don't know, a quarterly conference or something like that. I used to do it on a regular basis. And I got called to go again and I just I just didn't turn up. I knew that that was my, my instant resignation from the entire trade, completely not turning up, not bothering to call. Just couldn't do it, couldn't bring, bring myself to do it. So that's me. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, <laughs> I don't really give them monkeys to be quite honest. I know who I am, and uh, that's all that's really important to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm a changely leaving town on a midnight train. Because I ain't never been so broke that I couldn't leave town. Man, I walked out of my life with the clothes on my back, a rucksack, my dog by my side. <laughs> and my sister's wooden box. <laughs> that was really comfy. You know, talking to somebody about losing her when I was a teenager before, earlier today. And I realised I was sitting there looking at her box. It's the one thing that's been with me for all the goddamn years and for all the madness <laughs> the one sane thing in my life is a little wooden box with a lid on it <laughs> yeah, made by my sister, sister's fair hands it's all I've got of her literally all I've got of my entire family <laughs> that's my little shrine I guess yeah, yeah. heights of ecstasy and the depths of bloody misery it's been a wild bloody ride but I've learnt to roll with the punches you know, you know what I'm saying on the the neuroplasticity show on the university that that if you don't face your fears that you end up on this kind of like roller coaster ride where you never make it through the troughs and you just keep like, sort of running backwards and forwards on yourself. So really, you, you know, if you face adversities, all you got to do is gird your loins and keep moving in the same damn direction I and mean, keep on trucking and you'll get to wherever it was that you were going because if you were meant to be getting there, trust me, you will get there. No, I mean synchronicity. I don't even, I don't even think I've touched on this in any of the stuff. The, uh, I've told a few people that bloody um, electricity, the universe, and everything uh, video that I did to accompany the the show pod from uh, New Year's Eve with uh, Doctor Rock. Um, that's been getting some great acclaim and uh, interest, and you know, I mean, Wal Thornhill approved of it, and it's just blowing my mind. But what's what's really, really weird about that video is that I stacked up about, I think it was 50 individual clips in my editor. And each one of them I lifted off of the internet and edited to, I mean, as short a possible clip as I could get it down to. 
and basically took it from a keyword, having reviewed the sort of audio. I selected specific words that I knew would sort of be the start of a particular subject and went for that word in that particular video or the the image that accompanied that word in the particular video clip that I wanted to use. And uh, uh, and the biz- most bizarre thing happened when I... Uh, essentially, I was working with um, uh, Microsoft uh, Movie Maker, which is the most appalling line editing video suite I've ever had misfortune to have to work with it was literally like working with videotape again you had to do everything sequentially uh, I couldn't add the audio until the entire video timeline was finished because it didn't have any sort of audio incorporation features apart from just si- simply sticking a soundtrack on it um, and uh, in the end I think I actually queued up a sum total of about a hundred edit points of these 50 different videos, many of them were played through sort of multiple times, I mean twice or more um, just to fill the three hours, you know what I mean, finding video clips to fill three hours and editing them in isn't, isn't you know, it took me 80 bloody hours in total anyway the 80 hours was just the most basic of slash job edits, so basically I was like scrolling to where I knew in the audio a particular word came up and then I'd scroll through the video timeline until that particular frame on the timeline and I'd start the video sequence and that would run for you know I mean a minute and a half, two minutes, three minutes, however long that particular little sequence ran from there on into the text. Oh bugger me when I finally reviewed when the thing finally rendered, I mean it took like three hours just to render the thing from uh from the movie maker. And when I finally got to look at this bloody thing before I put it up online, I've got like chills going down my spine. Because there must be at least a thousand bloody cue points on that video. And I only put a tenth of those in. So all of the places when you're watching that video and an image pops up on the screen within a thousandth of a second of me saying the word, or even just before in many cases, I and mean, if I was queuing that as a video maker, I honestly couldn't have queued it any tighter. And there are ten times more than I actually queued. And all queued perfectly. And moreover, some of the images are so specific. I mean, when I mention Rule 23 in the Stephen Wolfram, the bloody image that comes up on screen literally as I'm saying, and there's this Rule 23. Rule 23 pops up on screen out of 250-odd process fractals that could have come up on screen in that particular video sequence. So, And and it's the only point in that sequence where that particular um, rule process fractal comes up on screen and there were hundreds of those I mean hundreds and hundreds and hundreds I'm talking, you know what I mean, if I put in a hundred cuts that means that there's, and there's like a thousand cue points, it's got to be like 900 cue points have been entered synchronously I mean the odds against that are just infinitesimal I mean, it's probably the odds against it are probably greater than the number of atoms in the universe to one you know I mean, a googleplex <laughs> to one <laughs> against so, you know, when stuff like that starts to happen, it's very difficult not to sit up and pay attention and think that something extraordinary has just occurred. It really is. It's a bit like when singers, you know what I mean, when great singers say they're struck by the muse and they don't feel like it's them that's doing the writing, it's somehow coming through them. You know, a lot of fundamentalist Christians will say that's because they become <laughs> become bloody um, inhabited by a demon. <laughs> <laughs> it's a demon inheriting me it must be one with lots of good messages for everybody because I can't see any harm in any of it oh that was yeah I don't think I even got around to saying that did I I'd finish saying that I think that was what I got disturbed during the whole electrobiology thing the reason why it's so bloody important to me is because if it's even remotely right even if it's only a, um, a fairly dumb model and not a not complete model even if it only works for a particular branch of plant biology, this will revolutionise um, permaculture because it will take it out of experiential. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, I mean, put this on your soil; it does it good. Sort of information to put this on your soil because of X, Y, and Z, and actually there'll be a, a rational model there with which to explain why you do what you do to your soil what effect it has on the plants, what effects you might see 
in the soil or in the plants it will be reflecting some imbalance within that naturally occurring exotically organised biological system that we call soil I doubt anybody that thinks that dirt is dirt go uh, to the university or I think I even put it up on the Freeman Jack channel and just put in uh, soil food web under the microscope and just have a look and see what both water and soil look like at that sort of scale it's a thousand times magnification stuff that I did on my new microscope here the, my own sort of biologically active soil here. I mean, yeah, I mean, I practice what I preach you know what I mean I don't talk the talk I walk the walk and it was walking the walk and being forced to talk the talk when I didn't want to to prove how I did what I did to somebody that didn't believe that it was possible that made me have to do the electrobiology I certainly didn't want to I was bloody busy at the time I'm always bloody busy Oh, Jesus, look at that. What's that? Oh, Christ, I need some better specs. That's quarter to nine. Oh, we've got uh, Sean McGuire coming up after me. Um, uh, I have no idea what he's doing. You have to look down. Look down. Down the page. Look down there. Look, look, not at me. Down there. And down the bottom there, it'll be in the upcoming thing. The the scrolly thing at the bottom. If you hang around for a while, it'll come around. Or you can like, scroll up and down, and you'll see Sean McGuire, and he'll tell you what he's got going on tonight. Um, I would do it but I just can't be asked. Um if you're that interested you go and look. It's down down there, not uh you'll sort it out. Um Where was I going with all of this? Was I going anywhere with all of this? Was there a point? Maybe. That is a good point. Maybe. Uncertainty. Probability. We live in a probabilistic universe, as I'll be presenting on Friday night with the Omniversity, Open Omniversity, Friday, Saturday, 1am GMT, 1 till 4am, yes, I am that mad git that goes on till 4am on Friday night, Saturday morning. Got no listeners at that. Well, no, that's not quite true as it goes. What did we keep this time? I can't remember. It was like 17, wasn't it? Right till the bitter end. They were even listening to my tunes till bloody 5am. Mad lot. Um, I don't expect anybody to stay up that late really especially not to listen to me rattle on um, but uh, it's always there in the podcast library so if you go to the uh, host's pods at the top of the, the page there uh, up there this time no not not we're not talking about down the, up up top of the page yeah there's the banner bit yeah where it says home and all that and uh, pods page yeah bottom right hand corner Omniversity go listen to all of them yeah Stick with it, yeah. I'll do my best to bring every subject from a kind of fairly basic nuts and bolts to a hopefully a staggering and inspirational conclusion. Uh, what we got up there so far, we've got the Googleplex, the the, uh, the world's first synthetic mind, talking about how the internet has become what it's become. And essentially, it's a, a lesson in, in internet use as much as anything. Um, I think that the uh, uh, the information age has effectively made uh, being literate with how the internet works the same as numeracy and literacy was of our day and so effectively if you don't know how the internet works, if you don't know how packet da- data is transferred if you don't understand the most basic functions of your computer you really need to go and listen to that Googleplex pod because it really is quite basic I've tried my very best to find the very best speakers on the subject and assemble uh, a linear sequence which will take you from point A to point B and by the time you get to point B hopefully you'll have a, a much better working understanding of what it is that you're using when you use the Google um, search engine or if you just use a Google Chromebook or even if you use Firefox and the likes and just use Google as a search engine there. Ignorance may be bliss, but uh, information, knowledge is power. Um, what did we have after that? Oh, yeah, neuroplasticity came after that. So we've got um, Can You Teach an Old Dog New Tricks? Um, neuroplasticity is all about how we are able to literally change our minds on a structural basis and rewire our own brains on a on a day-to-day basis and how it's actually quite easily achieved and how it can not only solve all sorts of psychiatric disorders quite simply and without the need for medical or 
uh, certainly can't chemical intervention. Um, it can also be used just simply to elevate everybody's life. Uh, there's absolutely no reason why you should ever feel obliged to continue doing any, following any course of action and, and following any sort of emotional patterns that are uncomfortable or unpleasant for you. Um, it's just simply not necessary. And I do, a, I mean, a three-hour show there where where I assemble um, possibly one of the most complete discussions on the topic that I know of on the internet. You'll find all sorts of um, very serious works on the subject, and, and uh, hopefully that's not quite so dry as the most serious of those, and it's not quite as shallow as the the most basic of them. But again, uh, done my best to assemble a topic in a linear fashion from its most basic constructs through to its ultimate sort of implications. Um, this week we've got um, plastic reality, holographic reality, digital virtual holographic reality, um, which again sounds like a very complex subject, but uh, um, basically reality isn't what you think it is. And uh, having interviewed Tom Campbell and uh, done all of his seminars and done all the Leonard Susskind and know about the Jim Gateses, the Dinkras and um, doing all my Rupert Sheldrake and and uh, then working with Ted Vollers and, and developing my own sort of numerical flux theory which is, is, a, is a component of what I would now describe as holographic reality theory um, I hope to again be able to present something from the very most basic of concepts and pursue it again through to a logical conclusion where I hopefully will present that this this reality isn't quite like the film The Matrix we're not living in quite that sort of a, a holographic reality but it's a pretty bloody good metaphor and surprisingly so um, and it's remarkable the number of um, uh, unanswerables that can be easily answered through uh, a modelling of reality, through the, the holographic reality theory model. Again, yeah, map is not the territory. You know what I mean? These things are models. Uh, I'm not saying for one moment that reality is a hologram, but if we have to model reality in any meaningful way, then it has to be in such a way that everything fits. And the fact that we currently have something that we know of as normal and another thing that we know of as paranormal means that there's a whole bunch of normality that just simply doesn't fit into science and that's the beauty of the, the digital holographic reality theory is not only does it perfectly explain quantum mechanics and uh, electrical theory and a whole heap of other um, sort of unjoined um, current models as a sort of overarching model but it also largely explains the paranormal too uh, to at least a, a very much more um, usable uh, mechanism than the, the just we don't know that we've got now. Uh, it also does away with pretty much all of the paradox in the sort of dogmas of science as well, which is always quite reassuring to see. All right, I'm going to bail out for these last few minutes. My throat's already getting a hack for it, and I want to keep it fresh for a uh, Friday night. You've had enough of me, I think, for now. Uh, as you can tell, these shows are going to be a bit, um, uh, <laughs> a bit slack. <laughs> Peak slack. I mean, there's another one of Anton Wilson's things. <laughs> it's not all about the 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 white fish or the black fish in the yin yang. It's all about being the squiggly line down the middle. And uh, as long as you don't have a, a slack deficit, or for that matter, get so so relaxed that you go sailing straight through peak slack and into excess slack. Yeah, and you got to reel back a bit and like find your peak slack. Uh, and when you hit peak slack, the universe just works with you. Yeah, that's the, the 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 shape of a river. That's the shape of a flame. That's the the shape of a vine. You know what I mean? There's a reason why. That's the shape of a galaxy. There's a reason why natural forms take that squiggly line shape. Uh, there's a a meditation for you all to be left with. Is peak slack be the wiggly line between the black and the white? Don't be the black or the white. Good night, people.